John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he returned to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught them. The legal experts and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Placing her in the center of the group, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They said this to test him, because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. They continued to question him, so he stood up and replied, Whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Bending down again, he wrote on the ground. And those who heard him went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. Finally, only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? And she said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. And I'd like to share with you from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, being because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you as an example, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he trusted to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For his wounds you have been healed. For you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and guide of your souls. Uh, now I'll be reading from Mark chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. While he was climbing into the boat, the one who had been demon-possessed pleaded with Jesus to let him come along as one of his disciples. But Jesus wouldn't allow it. Go home to your own people, Jesus said, and tell them what the Lord has done for you and how he has shown you mercy. The man went away and began to proclaim in the ten cities all that Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. And then finally, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men and women. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Here ends the reading of God's word for us this day. Today we are looking at another often overlooked area of ministry that has real potential for a lot of people. It is a place where most of us spend 65% of our waking lives. It is a place where there are already a lot of people who have not yet made a commitment to Christ. And this place is a place where we often have many long-standing relationships. And that place, of course, today, on this Stewardship Sunday, is the workplace. Or you can say school, if the workplace is school for you. If you have been praying for a ministry, and you haven't heard God's answer yet. The answer may be that God wants you to minister right where you are, right at school or right at work. And it fits scripture perfectly. Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20 says, 
Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them in whatever I commanded you. And surely I will be with you until the end of the age. Now one thing you may not know in that text, there is only one verb. At least that's how I see it. And what's that verb? Is it go? Or is it make disciples? Well, I believe it's make disciples. Here's what it says. It's not a command to go anywhere. It's a command to make disciples. So wherever you are as you go, wherever God sends you, make disciples. That's what it says. But now when you look in the New Testament, not all disciples went on a missionary journey. Some stayed right in Jerusalem. And why? Because some, maybe most, are called to make disciples at work or wherever God has planted them wherever they connect with other people. This is especially true for those who spend a lot of time at their workplace. You are so busy at work that there just isn't a potential for time in your life to find a ministry anywhere else. It's hard to serve on a committee, to get involved in the mission. It's also true for those who hate their job. If that's you, then I have a suggestion. And here it is. Stop working for the company. Stop working for the paycheck. Stop working for your boss. And start working for Jesus Christ. Change your focus. See your workplace as a mission field and begin to see yourself as a missionary in it and see what happens. Howard Hendricks tells a story. He was on an American Airlines and he was seated behind a very rude person on the plane. Rude, arrogant, disgusting. This guy was all that times four, apparently. And then the guy started to drink. And he became worse. He noticed the stewardess who was waiting on him all the time was absolutely unflappable. It didn't matter what happened. The guy never got under her skin. He was so impressed by her. He decided to go to the back of the plane after they finished serving some drinks to talk to her. He wanted to commend her. He also wanted the address of American Airlines and the name of her boss so he could commend her to the company. Here's what he, she said. She said, I don't work for American Airlines. I work for Jesus Christ. Now after he heard that, after he picked himself off the floor and shut his jaw, recovered a bit, she started telling him about the difference that Christ had made in her life. He was just incredibly impressed with her. But you may hear that story and say, nope, that's not me. No. Well, then maybe your experience is more like a man named Steve. Steve shares his experience saying this, all my gentle attempts to share the gospel were rebuffed and politely dismissed. <coughs> I didn't speak their jargon. I couldn't connect with them socially because most of their social events flew in the face of my personal morality and my high standards. The people around me became increasingly uneasy when I came into the room. In fact, 
people began to avoid me. I want to share the gospel with them, but I don't know how. I feel totally incompetent and ineffective. How do I reach my coworkers if they won't listen? Well, that's our focus this morning. How can we serve God in the workplace and reach our coworkers effectively? The first point I need to make is that being a witness at work is not a calling. It's not a gift. It has less to do with gifts and abilities than it being a matter of our essence. Our essence. We are all witnesses. In John's Gospel, it says the very same thing. We don't have a choice in the matter. As Christians, we are witnesses. In Matthew's Gospel, it says that we are all salt and light. This is just who we are. Once you put your faith in Christ, you become a witness. You become salt and light. The question is, how bright do you want to be? How salty? In other words, how the reason why Steve wasn't more effective was because when it came to sharing his faith at the workplace, Steve acted more like a hunter. What does a hunter do? Well, a hunter looks for prey. They go looking for someone to share the gospel with or have a religious conversation with. And when they find someone, they target the person. Whether the prey is ready or not, they get shot with the message of the gospel or something else, their testimony. Sometimes it works. But more often than not, the person gets wounded. People get hurt, people get embarrassed, people get put off. If you do that enough, what happens is when people see the hunter coming down the hallway at work, just like the deer do, they scatter. They don't want to be hit by the hunter. So many people see sharing their faith as being a hunter, Something that is pushed on people. Something that is unexpected, unwanted. And when they see you coming, they avoid you. They avoid you. If that is you. Or if you have had this experience. Or if you know someone like this. I think it is important to realize that God did not call us to be hunters. When God chose a metaphor to explain how to share your faith with others, he chose the analogy of fishing. Fishing. How many of you fish? Okay. Matthew 4.19 says this, Come, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men and women. What does a fisher need to do in order to be effective, in order to catch fish? Well, first, you need to know fish. <coughs> you just can't take any old pole on any old line with any old worm and throw it into the pond. You need to understand fish. There is a way of catching bass. There's a different way of catching walleye. There's a different way of catching northern pike, trout, bluegills. They are all different. All the fish take different lures 
different bait, different kinds of food. And it changes as well with location. So to be effective as a fisher, you need to understand fish. You need to understand fish in your area. You need to know them. And the same is true if you want to fish at work. You need to get to know people in a very personal, relational way. Now I know there are a lot of people who like to use their lunch time as their time for devotions or at least some quiet time by yourself because that's the only time maybe you have, especially if you use it for devotions, bless your heart. But if you want to be effective in reaching people at your workplace, then I encourage you to not use your lunch hours for devotions or quiet time. Instead, take the time to get to know the people at your workplace. Take someone to lunch or go to lunch with the gang. And then just listen, listen to people. People are dying for someone to listen to them, to their joys and their problems and their desires their goals. Sometimes if the opportunity allows, ask if you could pray for them. You don't have to pray right then and there. Let's all bow our heads. Just say, I will pray for that for you. If you know it's someone's birthday, bring them a cake. Mine's on the 22nd. <laughs> or someone had a baby, bring a gift, whatever it is, do something to get involved. Get to know the people in your workplace and let them get to know you. People are not disembodied spirits. They are people, and people matter to God. People will not care what you know until they know that you care. I love that. People will not care what you know until they know that you care. Paul says something similar in 1 Thessalonians. He says, because we love you so much, we are delighted to share not only the gospel or the good news with you, but our very lives. Over very lives. Are you sharing your very life with those you work with or those with whom you go to school or those with whom Jesus, God, puts in your day? If you want to reach them, it requires that you share your very life with them. What does a fisher need to do in order to be effective, in order to catch fish? First, you need to know the fish. Second, fishing is selective. If you want to be effective as a fisher, you know you can't catch every fish in the lake. Some fish are just not hungry. Some fish don't nibble. It's important to realize it's selective. You only share something about your life and your faith with those who are interested. And third, for a fisher to be effective, don't put the whole buffet on the hook. <laughs> Just a little morsel will do. Just a little morsel. This is what serving Christ in the workplace is like. Fishing. Witnessing that is casual and natural and confidently done by inserting fitting, fitting comments about God, about church, faith, or something spiritual into the conversation in a natural way, not a put-on way or a forced way. There are loads of people who have discovered this is a very effective way to share something about God in the workplace. Let me give you an example. 
A businessman was on an airplane. And he had learned this way of sharing his faith. And he was talking with another businessman on the plane. And as soon as the stewardess brought their meal, he wanted to say grace. But he didn't want the guy to feel uncomfortable. So he just said quietly to himself, but with words just loud enough to be heard. Oh, I am so hungry. This food looks great. Thank you, God, for all things good. And then he continued the discussion, the conversation that they were having. He didn't say anything else about God or his faith. After a bit, after they'd eaten, they went back to their own business. The guy began to read a book. And about an hour later, he put down his book and said, all right, I have a question for you about religion. And then they began to share. Again, you cast your line. You put out a little morsel. If they bite, that gives you the opportunity to share more and to answer their questions. If not, that's okay too. A fisherman, if anything, is patient. You throw out your line and you wait. Fishing for Christ in this way is just simply inserting <coughs> comments about God, about your faith, casually and naturally into your conversations. What I like about this approach is this, it's enjoyable. It's enjoyable to share about your faith with someone who wants to hear it because they asked you a question. You are not starting the conversation. You are not forcing it upon you. Let's talk about God. Let's talk about church. What do you believe? Second, it shows you what to say. With this method, fishing, there's no speech to memorize. You simply respond to a question that they ask because of the morsel you put up there. And maybe it's not even a morsel of words. Maybe it's a morsel <coughs> of your actions at work. You don't need to memorize anything. You simply answer their questions. And if you fear someone asking you a question you can't answer, there is one important thing that you can do. You can be honest with them and tell them that you don't know the answer, but that you will find it and get back to them. And believe me, friends, get back to them. Don't leave them hanging. Another thing I like about this way of sharing the faith, it's kind. It doesn't rub upon other people. It doesn't make them feel uncomfortable or embarrassed. People do not want to be pushed into the Christian faith. They won't take it hook, line, and sinker. They don't like to be snagged. They don't like to be shoved into the faith. They want to move. In 2 Peter, we can read, Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your heart reverence Christ as Lord. Always be ready to give an answer to, ear, to everyone who asks you the reason for your hope, the hope you have. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. Well, Pastor, what happens if I blow it? What if I don't set the hook and I don't reel them in? Well, here's what we need to know about that. If a person is meant to come to faith, God would make sure that our feeble attempts or lack thereof doesn't get in the way of their coming to salvation. God would make sure of that. 
so you can rest from worry. One, God is going to take care of it. And two, remember, not all the fishers can all catch all the fish. I want to close today with this one final thought. You can make a difference in the workplace. Theologian Mark Green once said, in the workplace, the witness comes in a form that cannot be tuned out like a radio program. It cannot be zapped like a TV broadcast. It cannot be thrown away like a Bible track. It cannot be turned down like an invitation to a concert. The person yet to accept Christ as their personal savior can tune out almost anything but he or she cannot tune out the spectacle of the Christian living in the power of the Spirit day by day, hour by hour, crisis by crisis at work. Isn't that great? Maybe God has called you to be a workplace witness. Friends, I believe God is calling you and I to fish at work or wherever you find yourselves involved with people other than your family. Instead of when you go to fish putting the sign out, gone fishing, when you head off to work, put the sign out, gone fishing. Remember, if you catch them, God will clean them.